Um, I'm going to reintroduce the idea of an unofficial start this morning. So uh, we used to have a few unofficial starts, so we're having an unofficial start this morning. So we'll start properly in a few minutes. Uh, but the unofficial start, I just want to clear up some confusion. Confusion that reigns when we sing an absolutely fantastic song. Now the fantastic song is Who Has Held the Oceans in His Hands, Behold Our God. Now in this song, we have a thing that the musicians call a bridge. Now, I have no idea why they call it a bridge, because a bridge goes from A to B, in my mind, whereas the musical bridge seems to take you from the song you're enjoying, takes you somewhere else, and then push you back in the song you're enjoying. So it's, it's more of a roundabout than a bridge, isn't it? Don't you think? <coughs> and, and the bridge is, um, in this song is, is this. Uh, and uh, we've all sung this before, but when we come to this point in singing this song, everybody starts looking at everybody else, looking completely confused. Now this bridge, sorry, this roundabout, is more confusing because it's in two parts. The first bit is the men, and they sing, You will reign forever. Is that right? Was that almost tuneful? That's not it. That's very tuneful. Was that the tune? I am to music what a charging rhinoceros is to subtlety. <laughs> um, and then the ladies sing. Let your glory fill the earth. Sounded beautiful as well, didn't it? Yeah. Come on. Come on. <laughs> so, can we all try that? Men with me and the ladies. Well, men with Rob. <laughs> and, and the ladies with Vicky. Are you ready? Just, are you ready? Take us, Rob. Two, three, four. So we're going to go round and round about four times this morning. So men, you can count it. You will reign forever. When you've sung that the fourth time, the ladies are going to fill your glory. And then you come in, the great crescendo of the song, Behold Your God. And that's the brilliant bit. But every time we sing it, we've all been confused. We come to the crescendo. We go, oh, we're back where we are. And, and that should be the real, yeah, fantastic. That's when all the arms should go up. Behold, we should be all there together. And that's why I'm doing this introduction. So we're going to try it now, all together, and then it's <laughs> no pressure. To me, of EasyJet cancelling our flight, is that this morning I'm here leading. Rather than looking at a beautiful scenery of Lake Bled, I'm looking at the beautiful scenery of the congregation here at Stainford. And you may think I'm joking, and I am a little bit, but it is a fantastic privilege to be able to stand up here 
and lead people in the worship of our God. It is a fantastic thing to stand. You ought to all come up here and try it and stand here looking out at people praising God. It's a fantastic thing. It's an immense privilege to be, to be here and to be able to worship his name, isn't it? Don't you think? Yes. Immense privilege. All that problems in COVID, we're back and it's fantastic. Uh, today we're looking at uh, Titus uh, chapter 2, uh, verses 11 to 15. It really would be good if you have a Bible. Um, if you've not got a Bible, grab them off the side, or if you've got your devices, please load them up. Um, the passage we're looking at is on page 1199 of the uh, Red Bible. <clears throat> so it's Titus chapter 2, uh, verse 11 to 15. And I'm going to read in the service, I'm going to read the passage twice. And the first time I read it, um, I've picked out words from this passage, and Brian will click, and the words will pick, uh, appear on the screen behind me. And the first set of words I've picked are about God, his character and his actions, or his attributes and his actions. And these become reasons to praise God. That's what I'm doing, the reasons to praise God. So as I read this, hopefully you'll see these words popping up, the attributes and actions of God. So Titus chapter 2, uh, verse 11, it says this, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that, is, that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These then are the things you should teach, encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. So, great, great words, don't you think? Great words about God. Have we got good reasons to praise our God this morning? Well, let's stand and we're going to sing two great praise songs, or praise to him, followed by Behold Our God. And then after that, if you've got the energy, please stay standing and three or four of you, or 30 or 40 of you, um, utter those phrases and praises to our great God. Let's praise him. Oh, praise to him, the God of light, who formed the mountains by his might. Oh, praise to him, who names the stars, that sings his fame in skies afar. Oh, praise to him, who reigns in love, who guides the God. Praise to him whose 
spoken to us and you've opened our hearts and you've shown us your way. And we thank you for Jesus this morning. Amen. Amen. Anybody else with a phrase of praise? Now is your moment. Amen. Father, accept our praises this morning as we offer them in Christ's name. Amen. <coughs> Please be seated. Before we do the praises and praises, I want to flash the clip back through those words. So go again to grace, salvation. passage we're looking at, Titus 2, 1 to 11, the actions, the attributes of God. Uh, what I want to do now is read the passage again, and this time we're going to pull out the bit words from the passage that refer to us, and how we as Christians should be living in the world today. Does that make sense? Everybody with me there? Yep. Yeah. So, <clears throat> let me read the passage again, and Brian will click along. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his, his very own, eager to do what is good. These then are the things you should teach, encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Now that's quite a list, isn't it? That's quite a list. And uh, I've got to be honest, I fail to live like that. I'm sure I failed this morning to be like that. I'm sure last week there was points where I've... Uh, not being as self-controlled as I should be. I've not said no to ungodliness. And I'm sure that's true for every one of us. And uh, <clears throat> I want to have a time now of confession and reflection, a few moments for us all to reflect and bring our own words of sorry to God. But know this, in Christ we're forgiven and tomorrow is a new day. Tomorrow we can do better for him. So I'll just leave a moment uh, maybe a minute for us each to bring our own thoughts, reflections and confession and then we'll read a prayer of confession together. Let's pray.
and reading together. Almighty God, our, our Heavenly, Heavenly Father, Father, we have, we have sinned, sinned against, against you and against, against each, each other, other in thought and word and action, through negligence, through weakness, and through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and turn away from all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again for us. Forgive us all that is past and help us to love, worship, and serve you in the light of your great love for us. Amen. We're going to sing the song, Refine as Fire, I'll Purify My Heart, and that I should sing it in the spirit of prayer and reflection. As I just said, remember, yesterday has gone. There's nothing we can do about that. Today and tomorrow, with God's help, we can be more like Christ. Let's sing this song. Remain seated and sing this song as a prayer. prayer. Purify my heart. praises hear also our confession and thoughts and our words of sorry and father we ask that you would by your spirit help each one of us to live more christ-like lives as we move on in this mad and sin sick world that we live in in his name we ask it amen it's time for the all age section And the difference between godliness, grace, and salvation. Um, grace is God's gift to us. Um, common grace, you look around in the park and you see the trees, you see the grass, you, the air you breathe, uh, the sunset, 
clouds in the sky. It's all things that we all appreciate and enjoy. Now, that's a gift. Salvation is a gift, but that requires an action, a thought. We need to think about um, whether or not we want to accept it or reject it. Um, once we've accepted salvation as a gift and we unpack it, um, there's that element of godliness straight after. And godliness is something we need to work on. It's not straightforward. It's not a gift like grace. Godliness is something we aspire to and we need to do stuff. So not only do we need to do stuff, in order to be godly, there's certain things we want to practice, we want to do the right thing. Um, it might be something simple like doing the right thing by going down the park and picking up litter and chucking it in a, an overflowing bin. Or it might be not doing certain things like not throwing litter down in the first place um, or not going to certain places or not hanging out in certain places. So how do we know what it is to be godly and what godly in this is? Well, if we look at the example of Jesus, then we know that Jesus went around and his main priority was teaching, um, helping people, healing people, feeding people, sitting with people and just discussing things with people. Um, so he was truly a people person. So while we wait for Jesus to return, we should be practicing godliness. And we have grace and we have salvation, but godliness is something we need to work on because um, it doesn't come easy and it came at a price. Now Jesus paid that price at Calvary to uh, redeem us from all his wickedness and I think the least we can do is exercise our faith by practicing godliness and working on being more godly people. God bless. It's worth watching that a few times, some quite profound things, uh, I feel. Um, Eunice is not uh, here today, so you've got me instead. Uh, so hopefully you've all got a copy of the newsletter. Have you all got a copy of the newsletter? Um, <clears throat> and I'd like to just point out a few things on here. Uh, the first section on the left is uh, the week's events, so please uh, read and digest. Um, <clears throat> I've, told this, I've said this joke before, haven't I? I remember at university when photocopying was a modern thing. And one of our lecturers had put a little note above the photocopier that said, uh, photocopying is no substitute for reading. <laughs> so holding the newsletter is no substitute for actually reading the newsletter. So you've got lots of stuff there to digest for the week. Um, <clears throat> this uh, evening, come back at 6 p.m. Uh, we're looking at uh, the uh, seminar in Revelation, Faithfulness in Testing Time, so please come uh, back for that. I've also got a special little green note from um, Sally to tell me that there's a slight error here. It says Friday the 8th of July that brain and soul boosting is on uh, Friday the 8th of July. It isn't. It's this week on Friday the 1st of July. So soul and brain boosting or brain and soul boosting this Friday the 1st of July, not Friday the 8th of July. Okay. Everyone heard that one? Uh, next week, um, Sunday the 3rd, we're looking forward to uh, Ben Lamb coming again. Um, his first visit, there was lots of positive comments about him, and he's coming again uh, next week uh, to preach. Um, and he's also going to be visiting a number of our midweek meetings at different times. He's arranged that with Joe. Um, he's trying to get to know us better, and we're trying to get to know him better as we uh, seek God's leading for our new pastor. So be clear, he's not coming with a view. We're not that far on in the process yet. We're just trying to make sure we get to know each other uh, very well. Um, please, please, please be much in prayer for that. 
uh, for God's leading of Ben and family and for God's leading of us too. Because uh, you know my prayer is that we won't be without a pastor for very long. Um, so uh, please uh, uh, think of that during the week as we look forward to next Sunday. Over there, there's a, something for you to note under these beautiful Dave Pulse pictures. Uh, the church members meeting, which was planned for June, is now on July the 12th. So please uh, make sure you've uh, clocked that. And then on the second page, a whole bunch of stuff there for prayer. Um, for Maureen, for Polly, for Lauren, for Pauline, for Margaret Williams, for Jason and family. Loads of stuff uh, for prayer. And then a couple of boxes, I won't read them out, but a couple of boxes there which are well worth you reading. And then the bottom box is Jason's induction at Grimsby. Uh, we've been invited to watch Jason being induced. Um, <clears throat> I've used that joke before, so anyway. Um, so it's uh, September the 10th. And uh, please let me know if you're interested. Most of you have now, I think. We've got 24 people who are coming. Um, if you're not let me know and you are planning to come, please do let me know because they need to know how many fish to catch. <laughs> because they're serving as tea, so clearly they need to know how many fish to catch. Um, <clears throat> uh, we were, or I was thinking of trying to organise a coach, um, and that looks financially very unlikely, let me say that. Unless you fancy paying £50 a person to go to Grimsby and back, um, I think that's highly unlikely. So we'll be trying to arrange lifts and the like. So that's uh, Jason's induction. Anything else anybody would like to say? By way of notice, that is. No? Good. Excellent. Thank you, children, for your patience. It's uh, now time for you to uh, leave. Let's just briefly pray for our children and for families and young people. Father, we thank you for our children. We've prayed for uh, more young people to come into the church and uh, you seem to be answering that prayer. It's great to see people going out at this stage of the service. And we pray for them right now and we pray for the people who are giving their time and energy to teach them. We pray that you will be as much in evidence in the back room as you are here. We do pray for our families, children and young people. We pray for your protection, your blessing, and your salvation. Uh, Father, it seems to me very often that the evil one has pitched the bat battle at that young age when people's minds are not made up, when people's minds are not clear. And we do pray for our young people. We pray for your protection, your blessing, and your salvation. In his name. Amen. Sally, wherever you are. Good morning. Um, I just want to share a little bit about uh, my time. Um, there we go. First, first dive. That's lovely. Uh, the uh, My Time Bereavement Support Group uh, that we run here on the third Monday of the month at half past ten uh, till twelve-ish. Um, the group name uh, sort of came from the Ecclesi Ecclesiastes, um, where it says there is a time for everything. A time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. And we recognise that uh, everyone's grief journey is different. We can be at different stages. So we're, we are, we're offering a safe place where we can support and care, listen and share, and encourage each other. Uh, slide two, please. Slide two. Um, I think this picture speaks for itself and we can perhaps identify with it. Um, so how do we explore what's really going on behind the smile, behind, behind the mask? There are lots of resources available to help and one of the ones we use, the next slide please, is called the Tree of Feelings. And um, 
It's allowed us to explore and share some of those feelings. And I have to say, it's been a privilege um, to be part of the group because we've been able to cry together and we've been able to laugh together. We're not quite dancing at the moment, but we may, <laughs> we can, might get there. There was a lovely quote this morning, actually, from Daily Bread, and I thought it just fitted so well, so I'll just share it. It said, when someone is broken, don't try to fix them. You can't. When someone is hurting, don't attempt to take away their pain. You can't. Instead, love them by walking beside them in the hurt you can. Because sometimes what people need is simply to know they aren't alone. Slide four, please. As Christians, we have a God who cares for us. And as Tim Chalice, who I like uh, very much, says, we have a saviour who's wept over his friends. And our tears and heartache are not unseen and unnoticed by the God of all comfort. So please pray that God will bless this work of ministry that we're offering, not just within the church, but to the community, as we seek to reach out and help others uh, on their journey. The invitation card... Um, I think it's hidden at the but the invitation card was designed by Dave Pools and it's called the, 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 the uh, 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 picture is called Buds of Hope and, and really that's what we pray that uh, my time will be a place of hope and uh, a place where people will come and know and feel God's love and comfort and compassion as we minister together. I've put some resources out um, on the table and you're very welcome to, um, to take anything or loan anything that you might find useful either for yourselves or to pass on to anyone else you know. So um, please do and uh, if you want to chat about anything um, then please do. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. That was lovely. We're going to pray um, for that in a minute, but I'll just share a little story. Just thinking about dancing. Uh, can't help it. This is just in my mind. Pauline and I went to the big church day out. That was many weeks ago. It was two weeks ago, three weeks. Anyway, we were, we were there. Um, 35,000 people on the field praising God. Any Rend Collective fans amongst us? Very good. Um, <coughs> the lead singer, whose name I can never remember, Chris. Um, yeah, they sang a few really upbeat tempo songs and everyone was waving about. And it was great, it was great fun. And he just said, let's remember why we're here. We're here to worship God. And he said, uh, it, will it be all right if we have a time of prayer? And everyone said, yeah, of course. And 35,000 people on the field, complete silence as he prayed. And he prayed a short but nice prayer. And he ended the prayer with this. He said, Lord, we ask you to work a mighty miracle here this night. Lord, get these English people to dance. <laughs> Which I thought was a fantastic way to end his prayer. And sure enough, they then taught us some Irish dancing. And on the stage, um, Chris bounced into another member of the band and knocked him flying. So <coughs> their dancing wasn't too good, really. <laughs> anyway, let's pray. Let's pray together. Uh, think of the work for um, my time and uh, a few other things as well. Father, we thank you for what Sally has just shared. Uh, there is a time for all things in life, and we thank you for those people who are rejoicing this morning, and we want to rejoice with them. And Father, we thank you for those people who are dancing this morning, and Father, I wish I could dance with them. And Father, we thank you, and we uh, uh, long to be a support for those people who are suffering and bereaved and uh, are dealing with horrible problems in their lives. Uh, Father, we know that you've not promised to take us out of this life, but Father, you have promised to walk with us step by step. And Father, we, we pray that for all those people who are struggling, 
uh, maybe for people who are sitting here who are uh, struggling with bereavement and uh, sad thoughts and difficult things in their lives. I pray that they will know for sure that the God of all comfort and the God of all love is walking beside them and is uh, putting his arm around them, those uh, majestic, mighty arms, uh, that uh, we would know your presence as we walk and navigate this mad life that we live in. Father, we pray for the people that we've just mentioned on the newsletter, people who have got particular uh, struggles for Maureen, for Polly, for Lauren, for Lauren, for Pauline, for Margaret, um, and uh, Father, for Jason and family as they're considering this change and move to Grimsby. Um, Father, <clears throat> we ask now that you will speak to us from your word through Jason. Father, by your spirit, move amongst us. Convict us, convince us, challenge us, enthuse us, and encourage us. In his name we ask these things. Amen. Before Jason comes to speak, uh, we're going to sing one more time. We're going to sing uh, a great hymn, Lord for the Years. And I've really chosen this for one line in the last verse, thinking about what Paul was talking about, godliness. And uh, on the last verse it says this, In living power, remake us. The Christian life is a life of transformation. Uh, God loves us as we are. We're all special to him. But he loves us far too much to leave us as we are. And uh, we are praying that in living power, he would remake us. Let's stand to sing.
morning. Do you want to be able to see me or are you all right like this? We're all right like this. You don't want me to put a light on? No? It's all right. That's fine. I can stay like this. No problem. What was that? Oh, someone on YouTube wants me to put the light on the account and see you very well. Did I say you can do that? <laughs> no, it's fine, Rob. It's fine. We'll go with the majority. Absolutely fine. How are you at waiting? <laughs> when I say the word waiting room, what image comes into your mind? Yeah. Railway state, dentist, doctors, yeah, all sorts of different places. Yeah, well, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking of the doctors when I was younger, <clears throat> old, sort of big room, no carpet, tiled floor, um, bare walls. Hard chairs sat round in a circle, dark coloured hard chairs, little table in the sort of middle with a few magazines on it, and lots of people going, <coughs> all looking pretty miserable, all looking pretty downcast really, struggling, some of them moaning, some of them just coughing. I mean, you know, to be fair, none of them wanted to be there. It was a doctor's waiting room. But it's changed. Is that your experience now when you go to the doctors? Is that what it feels like now? <laughs> yeah, it's just a phone call now, isn't it? We don't have to wait, we just, we just ring them up. Yeah, we can't get to the doctors, that's absolutely right. But when, when you did go, in the good old days, pre-2020, when people were able to go to the doctors when there was nothing wrong with them, you remember what it was like? There's TV on the wall, telling you not to smoke, and a few other little different things, but that one came up fairly regularly. There's a little blood test area in the corner where you can take your blood pressure and you can take a little ticket in with you. In the other corner, there's uh, some toys for the kids so they can get playing and different things like that. The magazines are sort of piled high, all sorts of different things. The chairs are quite comfortable, actually. It's different, isn't it? It's changed. I did a training day for a, a camp uh, a few years ago, and we were thinking about the different areas of the camp that we were on. And somebody said, you know, what about the queue for lunch? Now, that doesn't sound like the most important thing, does it? You know, we're thinking about the teaching program, we're thinking about getting alongside people, about the quiet times, about all these different things. But he said, what about the queue for lunch? He said, queues for lunch are a good thing. And we were like, well, why? He says, because, you know, in queues, people start talking to each other. And they do, don't they? Do you do that? If you're in a queue, you start talking to somebody, you just sort of stood there, and you turn around and you start talking. And he said, you know, don't rush into making sure you've got everybody sat down. He says, because a lot of work can actually happen in that time when you're waiting, when you're in the queue for lunch. And it made me see queues differently. Now, I was young at the time, and I just wanted my food, so uh, it didn't really matter. But when I went as a leader, I was thinking, this is an opportunity. Now, I, if I'm in a queue, I like to talk to people. I was in a queue last week. We went to Elverston Castle, and there was a queue for the ticket machine. There was only three of us, but you just start talking to somebody, don't you? It takes forever to connect with the bank. I think there's a little bloke inside that gets out and runs down to Derby, and then comes back and goes back and presses the button and says, yeah, that's okay, but it's in, waiting for the bank, waiting for the bank, waiting for the bank. It seems to take forever, so you talk to a guy in front of you or whatever. It's an opportunity, isn't it, to chat with people. What do we do while we wait? What do we do while we wait? Well... Certainly doctor's surgeries have thought about that and have tried to make it a more pleasant experience for us. They know that people are going to have to wait, and so they try and make it a little bit more pleasant. What about you? What do you do while you wait? What do you do? What different situations are you in where you have to wait and think about things? How did you feel this morning when it took a while for the old age thing to come up? Thank you very much, guys, by the way, at the back there. Did you think, what's going on? Or did you just think, no, this is nice, this is fine. Just, we, can, we can relax for a little minute. We think of things differently, don't we? What do you do while you wait? As I've said, I like to try and talk to the people around me, but I didn't do that when the old age thing was coming up. I didn't think that was appropriate. I thought, no, I'll just sit here in silence because that's the accepted thing to do in the middle of a service, isn't it? 
And yet, if John had said, this is going to take a few minutes, just turn to each other, straight away, that's what we would have done. We would wait in different ways, don't we? You know, the three words in this passage that Paul uses to put into context what he's saying. We've heard of a lot of words this morning. John's pulled out the words that we think about God. He's pulled out the words where we think about ourselves. Paul has pulled out the uh, idea that we need to be moving on from ungodliness and, and being godly and how difficult and challenging that could be in our lives. But Paul gives us three words that I think put a context to all of these verses. And at the beginning of verse 13, these three words. While we wait. While we wait. I wonder if you spotted them. They're not the most obvious verses that you want to pull out. John brought them out. They're great, aren't they? The words like redeem and glory. We, we love them. But Paul says here, while you wait. And he's telling us what to do while we wait. In other words, he's telling us how to wait. Now, not in a doctor's waiting room or a ticket machine or in a post office or anything like that. But for something big. Something huge. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to think about what he's saying. We're going to think about how we wait, because I think that's what Paul's trying to say. How do you wait? How do you wait well? But to do that, before we get there, I just want to think about two other things. I want to think about why we wait and what we wait for. So we're looking at the why, what, and how of waiting. Is that all right? The why, what, and how of waiting. So firstly, why do we wait? Why do we wait? I don't mean, as I said, in you know, doctor's surgery and things like that. That's just life and different things. But, but on a Christian perspective, in this passage, when Paul's, Paul's talking about this waiting, why are we waiting for something? And the answer is this, because we are promised a blessed hope. That's what he says. While we wait for the blessed hope. He goes on, verse 14, he gives more of the answer. Let me read it to you. Because Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that, he, that are his very own, eager to do what is good. We're waiting as Christians because someone has done something incredible for us in the past, which gives us a hope for the future. And it's that hope in the future that we're waiting for. Jesus has given himself for us. We know what that means from the rest of the scriptures. Now Paul here is not explaining it, he's just reminding Timothy of it. Uh, no he's not, he's reminding Titus. He reminds Timothy when he writes to Timothy. Titus already knows it, but Paul's reminding him that what he does in Crete, he does because of what Jesus has already done for him. And that's the same for all of us, isn't it? What we do, we do for God because we know what Jesus has already done for us. What did he do? He gave himself to redeem us. We were in a situation that we could not get out of. We were slaves to sin, living for ourselves without God in the world and without hope, as Paul puts it in Ephesians. We were at the market on Thursday. It was the first day when we was, had the opportunity to have a market stall on Thursday morning. And we were there, and there were some people from Pastors Church, uh, some people popped in from St. Helens, some people from the Methodist. It was great. It was an opportunity just to add things like the prime time, uh, prime time, my time, sorry, uh, my time leaflets that Sally was talking about earlier, and, and refresh leaflets and illuminate leaflets. So we were on this stall, and there's leaflets from the church, and there's leaflets from the different churches in Stableford. And we were there, and we were able just to, to chat with people and to talk to people who were wandering around. And one of the ladies on the stall said, oh, I've just been chatting to a lady. And she said, I was talking to her about faith. And it was clear that this lady had no faith. She said that. She said that she had no faith. And it was also clear that she had no hope. She said that when she dies, she'll go into the ground, and that will be it. That's what she said. No hope. Now, Maybe hope in earthly things. She may hope to win the lottery or something like that. I don't know. She may hope for something better or something bigger than what's going on in life at the minute. But no hope beyond death. No hope beyond death. And she was, you know, a normal, nice, pleasant lady. You know, she didn't walk around saying, oh, I've got no hope. 
she was just getting on with life and just doing whatever she does, like most people that we meet actually out in the world. Just getting on with it and doing it. You know, it didn't bother her <clears throat> that that was her future. It didn't bother her that this life is all there is and then one day she'll die and that'll be it. So it appears this hope isn't something we need in this life. A lot of people don't think about it, do they? A lot of people reject it. There are many without it. Some have a vague hope, some have a hope that they hope. <laughs> Things might be all right afterwards. Might be something after this life. But some have none at all and think that this life is all there is. So why are we thinking about waiting for this blessed hope? I mean, why even use those words? Well, it's because Jesus is a game changer, isn't he? Jesus is a game changer. He's come into this world and he's given himself for us. He has shown us that there is something more than just this life. And he was so serious about it. He was so serious about it that he gave his life for us. That's what Paul means here when he says he gave himself for us. He didn't give up a Sunday afternoon. You might do that, a bit of a push. He didn't give up a holiday. You might have to do that if your flights are cancelled. He didn't give up a couple of years. He didn't even just give up, or just, he didn't even give up a lifetime. He gave his whole life. Every minute of it, every second of it, so that he could live a perfect life, so that when he died, Paul could say, it was for us. He died for us, in our place. And Paul goes on to, the, to explain the effect of it. It's to redeem us from all wickedness and purify us. What happened was, he, Jesus, in his purity, took on the evil of this world. He took on the wickedness that is in this world. And there was a time when it looked like that wickedness was stronger. There was a time when it looked like that evil had won. When he died on the cross, what happened to the hope of the disciples? It had gone. It evaporated. They ran. They didn't know what to do. They've been with him for so long and now he's gone. And it looks like this evil has won. The hope is gone. It seemed like the light of the world that Jesus had called himself, the light of the world had been extinguished. It had gone out. But all that changed, didn't it? All that changed on the day of resurrection. <clears throat> because on that day, the light started to shine. And it shines brighter and brighter and brighter. And it shows us the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That good has overcome evil. That his purity has overcome wickedness. And that can be the same within us. <clears throat> Not just out there in the world. But also within us. He gave himself for us. So that he can overcome that wickedness inside of us and make us pure and that's not an abstract thing a far away thing it's actually a personal thing Paul says he redeems us from all wickedness to purify a people us those who know him for himself he gave himself to purify a people for himself a people that are his very own this is relational it's not just that he gets on with this thing over there a couple of thousand years ago it impacts our lives today because we know him don't we we know the one who's given himself for us it's relational he wants to purify people for himself he calls us to himself and having given himself for us he wants to now transform us so instead of living for ourselves, we can be what Paul says, people who are eager to do what is good. What a transformation. It's a depth of transformation 
in us as humans that's possible because of the depth of sacrifice. It's possible because of the depth, depth of sacrifice. He gives himself for us so that we can give ourselves to him. Why do we wait? Because we have a hope, a blessed hope. Jesus has brought hope where there was none. There wasn't any hope beyond death. And Jesus has brought a hope into this world. And he secured that hope for us by giving himself for us. That's why we wait. Because we have a hope when we look forward. We know that that hope is sure because when we look back, we see what Jesus has done about it. He secured it through his death and resurrection. So we have this hope in the future. Secondly, what are we waiting for? Now this is important. We need to know what we're waiting for. What is this hope? When this hope is realized, what is it? You know, early on in COVID, so whenever it was, uh, I was talking to somebody. I think T was playing football, and I was talking to one of the dads. uh, And his wife had lived in a a country under uh, very harsh communist rule when she was younger. Uh, And she, she was saying how interesting it was that we were running out of toilet roll and pasta. Do you remember that? Straight away. Yeah, there was a sniff that something might be wrong, all the toilet roll, all the pasta completely emptied off the shelves. Interesting, isn't it? That's what happened. And he said, you know, my wife said it's like when she was younger. He said, we're getting to that stage when she was in a communist-ruled uh, country and everything was hard to come by, not just toilet roll and pasta, but pretty much everything. And she said, you'd be going down the street and you would see a queue start to form and you'd join it. Seriously, it's how they live. He said, you'd see a queue and you'd join it. He said, you have no idea why. You no idea what it was that you'd join the queue for. But you knew if there was a queue, somebody somewhere had something. And you might be able to get a part of it. No idea why they're waiting. They stand there. No idea what for. Now, maybe, you know, rippled down and people started to say, you know, somebody's, you know, there's a new pair of shoes or, or whatever it is. Or there's some, there's some meat or there's some vegetable. Who knows? But we know what we're waiting for. We haven't joined a queue and think, well, there's this sort of thing in the future. Uh, Well, we don't really know what it is, but I mean, it's going to be really nice. I'm sure it'll be good. It's not that. Paul says in verse 13, we wait for the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. That's the hope that we have. That the person that's given himself for us is coming back again. We wait for the one who's given himself. This appearing, his coming. This is the blessed hope. We wait for a time when the wickedness that has been defeated will also be extinct. We won't see it anymore. Don't we long for that time? When the wickedness that has been defeated on the cross will be extinct. And this isn't a hope like the the possibility of a lottery win. Biblical hope is a sure thing. <clears throat> it's not something that might happen. Excuse me. <clears throat> it's not just a possibility. It's something that we can trust in. Because the one who said it is the one who gave himself for us. The one who defeated death will appear. Why do we wait? Because he's given himself for us. What are we waiting for? He's coming back again. So, finally, we get to the main thrust of the passage. Final point, third thing, how do we wait? How do we wait? When we're Christians, it's like suddenly we're put into a waiting room. I mean, we carry on with life and get on with things, but we are waiting for something. Waiting for something huge, something big, something important. Something we know that's going to wrap up all of creation, and a new creation is going to be ushered in. One where there is no evil or dying or pain or sorrow, for the former things have passed away. That's what we're waiting for. How do we wait? Well, three things. Three things to help us this morning. First thing, by remembering God's grace. We wait by remembering God's grace. Verse 11. The proactiveness of God. He has seen us in our powerless state. He has seen that we have no hope and he's done something about it. He hasn't left us in that state with no hope. With all the frustration that we feel at the world around us. With the wickedness that we often see winning. 
He has done something gracious. He has given his son. Why? So that verse 11, salvation can be offered to all people. We remember the grace of God that offers salvation to all people. So firstly, remember grace, that grace that is offered. And secondly, know that it's that grace that transforms you. It's that grace that transforms you. Not your best efforts, but that grace. This grace teaches us. It's so... Oh, what's the word? I haven't written this one down. Can't think of it. I don't know. Compelling will do. It's not what I wanted to say, but it, it's so compelling. It's so strong. It's so deep with inside of us that it has this transforming effect. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Can we say no to ungodliness and worldly passions in our own natural state? No. But the grace of God teaches us to be able to say no. The temptations that would seek to destroy us, we can overcome them because God, by his grace, gives us the strength to say no. We no longer live for ourselves. He helps us to think outwardly. He helps us to live for others and not just our own pleasures and our own good. You know, this grace is so powerful. It can take a selfish, self-absorbed person and change them from the inside out. And it has done. Generation after generation, the grace of God changed people. So powerful. So important that we don't just live as we please, but we now have the power to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. You remember Grange Hill? If you're around my age, you probably remember it. If you were in the church at that time, you were probably not allowed to watch it, but I wasn't in the church at that time, and, uh, and I did watch it. And they did a drug story. A young kid called Samo, or Zamo, I can't remember his, his, his exact name. He got addicted to drugs, and they ran this campaign, this slogan. It turned into a song. I won't sing. You've had John singing this morning. You don't need mine as well. Just say no. Remember that? It was like an earworm. It got in. It just said, just, just say no. It was this, that was all it was. When we thought of illegal drugs, the, 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 the point was they knew that it was becoming an issue in society back in the early 80s. Drug addiction. They knew it was becoming an issue. They, they ran this story in Grange Hill about this kid that got addicted to drugs. And they, they, it wasn't particularly him that they were aiming it at. They were showing you what it can be like to be an addict. And then they were saying, look, this is the message. Just say no. If someone offers you drugs, just say no. Illegal drugs, that is. And if we wipe out all the drugs, we'll all have to go home now, won't we? Because I'm sure we're all on something that's helping us to uh, do something in life. But illegal drugs. And Katrina and I were on honeymoon. We were walking around the corner. We were walking um, just up the main street and then we went out just round the corner up top little guy sat there two or three guys just walked round the corner and one went hashish marijuana hashish and we were like um, uh, <laughs> just say no we just walked on might have been different if I'd never seen Grange Hill who knows well I knew enough by then to know that it was going to be something that was addictive we didn't need it we didn't want it just say no why because of where it can lead. Because of where you're going to end up. You know the power of these drugs. That they draw you in with a, a high and an experience. And they can become very easily addictive. You know, the grace of God is so powerful. It teaches us to say no. It teaches us to say no. Not just to drugs, but to ungodliness. To worldly passions. I guess that in some ways is the negative way of putting it, isn't it? But there's also a positive way. At the end of verse 12, Paul says, we can live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Negatively, we say no to the bad things. Positively, we say yes to the good things. That's what Paul's saying. Self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. So first of all, remember grace. Secondly, know that that grace transforms. And then thirdly, the, God, sorry, the grace of God gives us the ability to, to do what is right. It's not just a, you know, you become a Christian so you can't have any fun anymore. Anyone ever said that to you? 
You ever feel like that? You become a Christian, so you can't do these things anymore. Well, the thing is, you become a Christian, you look at these things and you think, well, I don't want to do them anymore. They're no good for me. But it's not just about that side of things, isn't it? It's not like, well, we don't want to do them anymore, but we can do these now. We can be the God the people that God intended us to be. We can be the people that God wants us to be. We can be concerned about the things that God is concerned about. It's not just the negative of not being able to do this. It's the positive of being people of godly character. He wants us to be living self-controlled, upright and holy, godly lives. Lives that please him, that overcome wickedness and are pure. And I, you know, I guess... Just a note here, um, how these things can be taken if we're not careful. Ungodliness and worldly passions in our culture are seen as fun, aren't they? Seen as normal, seen as, as an expression of yourself. That's how you express yourself. Be who you are, be true to yourself. Paul is saying, no, don't do that. That is not going to help in any way, shape or form. You've got this power now, the strength, God's grace, to be able to say no to those things. Be who you want to be is, is a massive strap line for our culture. And don't let anybody tell you any differently. Well, you can listen to them if you want, or you can listen to the Apostle Paul. Paul says God's grace has appeared. God has intervened. God is giving us a better way. A self-controlled rather than self-centered way. A godly rather than ungodly way. An upright rather than deceitful way. Godliness, self-control and uprightness. And not things that drain the fun out of life. Of course, if we try and do them without the transforming power of God's grace, then that may well be the case and may feel like the case. But they're not. When... They are grace-filled. They are things that show our potential to be truly human rather than less than human. You know, people just giving in to their own desires and trying to be who they think they are, it seems to me takes away from their humanity rather than adds to it. The grace of God seeks to restore the image of him in us that we had at the beginning when he created us. That image that has been marred by the fall. You know, his project is to restore us to a former glory that was inherently ours, but we have lost. Chitty, chitty, bang, bang. <laughs> what a brilliant example. You get a race car. You remember that film? Remember, you, nobody remembers the first bit, I don't think. The first bit is a racing car that's going around and winning lots of Grand Prix all the way around the world. Um, you often don't remember that bit. You remember the other stuff that comes later. It's a racing car. It's the best car in the world. It ends up on a scrap heap. It's had it. It's been sold for scrap. Two kids are playing on it. And they're like, no, no, don't get rid of the car for scrap. We want it. We'll go and find our dad. Dad, we want this car. He can't afford it. He can't. He has to, he has to do something to get it. He has to sacrifice to get it. He ends up going, and, and, he, and he, 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 in a strange way, where he's never realised, he, he gets a load of money and he's able to go, and he, and he gets the car. And then what happens? He transforms it so that it's even better than its former glory. It's not a racing car anymore that goes around the world. It's a flying car that can go to different lands and save people. It's incredible. It's the gospel. You might not have realised that before. That's what God wants to do with us. By his grace, we have this inherent glory in him. We, we bear his image. That image has been fallen. And, and in effect, I don't know if this is the right thing to say, but it's almost like we're only good for the scrap heap. And so God says, I'm going to save them from the scrap heap. I'm going to do something. So Jesus comes and he gives himself for us so that God can get to work on us. Like Karatikus Pots. Not sure that God's ever been described as Karatikas pots before, but he spends time and energy and effort taking this thing that was only good for the scrap heap and transforming it into something that's even more glorious than it was originally. And that's what God wants to do with us. He wants to take us and he wants to transform us and he wants to restore us so that we're image bearers again, self-controlled, upright and godly people. The grace of God 
has the power to transform. His grace has appeared. We don't give in to worldly passions, whatever they may be, because we realize that God's working on us. The worldly passions are the things that will lead us to the scrap heap. The things that God wants are things that will endure, that will restore, that will help us to be the people that he wants us to be. We are in waiting. Why are we waiting? Because the one who gave himself for us has promised to come back. How do we wait? Knowing that that grace of God that has saved us is also transforming us to be the people that he wants us to be. God is working in us by his spirit. Every time, every time, you don't give in to sinful temptations. Whatever it may be, you're waiting well. You're showing that you're on the same side as God, that you want the same things for your life that God wants. You want to be restored. You want that image to be completed within you. You show that you understand that you're living in this present age, as Paul says, but you also know that you're waiting for an age to come. This understanding of grace is so important that Titus is to teach it, encourage it, and rebuke those who ignore it. If you become a Christian, if you humble yourself before God and recognize your sin before him, and know that Jesus has died for your sin upon the cross, that he gave himself for you, it's because he wants to transform you. He wants to change you into the person that you can be. The person that he wants you to be. Why is this grace so important? Why does Timothy need to teach it and encourage people in it and rebuke those who ignore it? Because without that grace, we will lose the hope. And we'll end up back where we were. Without the grace, we'll lose the hope. That transforming grace that God wants to do within us means that the hope will stay alive when we remember grace. And through that grace, as we say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and are transformed to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. While we wait. While we wait. For the blessed hope. The appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together, shall we? Oh Lord, we recognize that we're waiting this passage tells us that and we know from our own experiences in the world waiting can be a a, a negative thing a bad thing but maybe just because we haven't seen it right sometimes it can be a good thing we can build relationships we can start talking to people chatting to people getting to know people it can be a good thing lord while we wait here for the appearance of the lord jesus christ to come in glory we pray that you would help us to wait well We pray that you'd help us to be those who remember your grace. We pray that that transforming power of that grace would help us to say no to all the things that are no good for us and that are going to just continue to destroy that that image of you in us and help us to say yes to all those things that are good for us. Help us to be self-controlled. That is so powerful that the Holy Spirit himself can give us the strength to be self-controlled, that we can say no to things that before we just did and didn't even realize there was anything wrong with half the time. Help us to be upright. Help us to be godly so that we won't lose that hope, we pray. Help us to be those who wait well. Transform us by your grace, we ask. Continue day in and day out until that day when we see you face to face, we ask. Amen. Okay, let's stand and sing. You've all been waiting very well for this last song. Thank you for that. We're going to sing. It's a fairly new one, but we have sung it a few times, so hopefully uh, everybody knows it. Come praise and glorify our God, the Father of our Lord. Thank you, guys.
us again. <laughs> so did I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so just uh, these words as we go. The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.